Good evening, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us for this evening's Red Barn event. I'm Rebecca. I'm the Education Director here at WRI. Our other staff member here this evening is Joshua, who's over running the tech stuff right now. Joshua is one of our community programs educators who does things like plan our Red Barn events. Um, and thank you so much to Lissy for being our volunteer server this evening. I'd like to open this evening by sharing a land acknowledgement. This land acknowledgement was created alongside the Shin Piskwashu people. We are spreading the message they wish to be spread to the public. The land Wenatchee River Institute sits on is the ancestral homelands of the Shin Piskwashu people. The Shin Piskwashu, meaning people in between, had villages positioned along the Wenatchee River and surrounding areas. Their ancestral homelands extends from the Cascade Ridge throughout what is now known as the Wenatchee and Okanagan Valleys. The culture and economy of the Shimpisquashu people centers on taking care of the land. They fish, hunt, gather roots and berries, and basket making materials and medicines. The Shimpisquashu are named in the Yakima Treaty of 1855. Language to establish the Wenatchee Reservation was never followed through, even though the needed surveying was completed. Many Shimpisquashu now live on the Colville Reservation, 150 miles northeast of Leavenworth. They were forced off their land here, and the U.S. government moved them to this reservation. The Shinpisquashu people are still alive today. They continue to practice their culture, harvest their traditional foods and medicine, and hold their ceremonies passed down from their ancestors. Most people won't see or notice them, but they continue to be on the land they are connected to. Their traditional language is in Hamchin, an interior Salish dialect, and we would like to welcome you all by saying hello in their language, Tilhusht. We offer this land acknowledgement as the first step to amplifying indigenous voices and recognizing the harm done to them as a people. We stand as an ally to recognize their connection to the land and their rights to practice their culture on the sacred lands. We encourage all to learn about the indigenous peoples of the place you now call home. The Wenatchee River Institute is committed to sharing this land acknowledgement and following up with other actions to educate and be respectful. At the Wenatchee River Institute, our mission is to connect people, communities, and the natural world. And we do that through our youth and community education programs. For example, this week, our youth education programs have had students here on our campus. They're in this very space um, doing matchstick forests to learn about fire ecology just a few hours ago before we transformed it into our Red Barn event space. Um, and our staff has traveled to classrooms as far away as Manson Elementary School for a traveling naturalist in a classroom program. Our community programs includes events like this Red Barn event, our autumn ambles that are starting tomorrow, um, and workshops like this weekend's visit to the Hawk Watch site at Chelan Ridge. I also want to take a minute to recognize our Red Barn event sponsors. We are so grateful to these businesses for their support. And hopefully you saw them scrolling through. We've got their logos up here, but I want to share the full list because we really couldn't do it without our supporters. Our Red Barn event sponsors this year are Gustav's Grill and Beer Garden, Ludwig's German Restaurant, the Obertel Inn, Posey Handpicked Goods, South Restaurants, Hotel Pension Anna, Moonshin House, The Sleeping Lady Mountain Resort, North Central Washington Audubon Society, Icicle Brewing, The Cove Resort at Fish Lake, Kolchak Consignment, Riverfront Rock Gym, and The Mountain Home Lodge. So as you are out and about in the community, those are the folks who have supported WRI specifically through Red Barn event sponsorships. And now it's time to introduce our speaker. We are grateful to have Tim, o Tim Connor here this evening. Timothy Connor is a national award-winning journalist and nature photographer based in Spokane. His investigative reporting on the Hanford Nuclear Reservation's environmental and public health hazards in the early 1980s led to a decade of successful public activism to bring the nation's nuclear weapons plants under stricter public scrutiny and regulation. He has also been deeply involved in efforts to reform police accountability and to protect vulnerable communities in Washington from air pollution caused by mass agricultural burning. As a journalist, he has earned multiple regional and national awards from the Society of Professional Journalism for both his print and broadcast reporting. Beautiful Wounds is his fifth book, and we're so happy he's here to share that with us this evening. 
And without further ado, Tim, thank you so much for being here. Thank you for coming. First, let me also thank the Book for All Seasons and the Institute for All Seasons. It was really fun, and it's, I'm, I'm stuck into a book for all the people, so, and it's always been really busy, I, and I'm, I'm so grateful they like the book, and it's so nice, and it's really cool. Um, so, uh, the anniversary of the Hell of Living Europe, and it's so fantastic, and, uh, I'll never forget one of my friends, uh, I guess her husband uh, was, uh, so she brought her mom um, as her date that evening, and she brought her mom up to introduce me to her. And there'd just been an article in the spokesman about the uh, uh, about the the personal sorrow involved in my sojourn, so to speak. And and anyway. Uh, her mom was um, looking a little reserved, and my friend said quickly, uh, "Yeah, you know, she said something about so you're taking me out for an for an evening of depression and divorce." <laughs> 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 anyway, uh, yes, <laughs> um, but you know, we've got uh, we've got we've got geologists, we've got birds, we've got we've got all kinds of critters, and I'm going to get to that. I um, also want to acknowledge my daughter Audrey is here tonight. That's her in the back there. Help me set up. And uh, this book is dedicated to her. Uh, I had to pick a chapter to read tonight. Uh, reading the whole book would just be too much fun for you. Um, and I decided to read uh, a, a chapter called uh, Grand, Grand Chasms, which uh, features both Audrey and in a small way, um, it features this place. But and which I'll come to it. I, I don't want to give away the story. So I'm going to do that first. And then what we're going to do is um, I'm going to show you my slideshow. It won't be depressing, trust me. And then I've got an eight minute video, which doesn't include any speaking for me. It's all the sounds of nature, water, birds. Um, and um, anyway, I don't want to give that away either, but I think you'll enjoy that too. And then uh, if we have time left, I'll be glad to answer a few questions. So let me get started by uh, sitting down and reading Grand Chasms for you. I need my glasses for that. The first time I sought refuge in Northrop Canyon was on a late summer day as I was on my way home from a funeral. I was grieving the loss of one of my mentors and resisting the pull of familiar surroundings and distractions, which is where the highway would have taken me. The fork in the road was just beyond Cooley City where US Route 2 crosses the long earthen dam separating Banks Lake from Dry Falls and the corrugated grandeur of Lower Grand Coulee. Instead of continuing eastward towards Spokane, I followed Washington Route 155 northward along the lake and deep into the throat of Upper Grand Coulee. Unlike the Lower Coulee, which braised into a labyrinth of interconnected canyons several miles across, the Upper Coulee leaves Cooley City as a U-shaped half pipe. The coulee is natural, but the 27 mile long reservoir that floods the trough is nothing of the sort. Banks Lake, Banks Lake is Columbia River water that's pumped uphill, nearly 300 feet for irrigation storage. On a calm day, the surface of the two mile wide reservoir becomes a reflecting pool for the cliffs that tower above it. To correctly imagine the height of the cliffs, it may help to envision the space needle holding up the Statue of Liberty, including the pedestal. Midway between Cooley City and Grand Cooley Dam, the highway ramps up a talus slope where it offers a panoramic view toward Electric City, population 1001. The island blade of Steamboat Rock is visible on the northern horizon. The scale of Upper Grand Cooley is so expansive you can easily lose perspective. When you're in the trough of the Cooley, Steamboat Rock appears to have risen below like an uplifted mountain. At the crest on 155, you can see that the signature anvil is actually just a surviving chunk of the former plain that the, the floodwaters tore away. <laughs> the nakedness of the rock walls and treeless landscape can also lull you into a sense that everything is exposed and in sight, that all dimensions are visible in shades of earth, water, and sky. But that's also an illusion, and Northrop Canyon is proof of that. The memories of my old friend Bill Mitchell were like a loose pile of photographs, and leafing through them brought tears to my eyes. 
It was through Bill that I'd met my wife, Connie, a therapist and peace activist from South Carolina. And six years later, just hours after our first child was born, I took a picture of him laughing with delight as he held tiny Audrey in his arms. Most importantly, his life was devoted to bringing people together and helping them protect their neighborhoods from perfidy and pollution. He'd fought the good fight. At his crowded memorial on Vashon Island, people from all over the country had come to share their stories and gratitude. I wanted to be alone for a while longer to think more deeply about what his life meant to me and my family. And that's how I wound up in Northrop Canyon, which is invisible from Route 155, but reachable on a gravel road that climbs over a ridge at the base of the canyon. Of course, Brett's had been there decades before I hiked in. Uh, this is Jay Harlan Brett's, a famous geologist. He was meticulous about using measurements to soberly insist that such epic landscapes could only be explained by catastrophic floods that overwhelmed existing drainages and created new ones on a grand scale. And still he would often address his detractors and skeptical peers indirectly, all but pleading with them to open their eyes. Quote, again and again, the writer has asked others and himself, where is the dangerously weak point in the flood hypothesis, he wrote in 1932. One can stand on the brink of Northrop Canyon and aver with confidence that it can never be satisfactorily explained except as an extinct Niagara. Close quote. The questions I was wrestling with that summer afternoon had more to do with mortality, human aspiration, and transcendence than with geology. But that may be unfair to Brett's because his devotion to reason is what drove him. His legacy isn't so much about the stories and the rocks as it is about how we extract truth from a world that is rel as reluctant to disclose it as humans can be to accept it. My departed friend had motivated and challenged me and given me the opportunity to prove myself. Had I rewarded his confidence and trust, had I made the best of it? There were other questions, all of a sort that could bring you to your knees in church. My first impression upon walking into Northrop Canyon was that I had walked into a church, <laughs> a magnificent natural cathedral. From a narrow entry at a rocky bench above Banks Lake, the main, main trail into the well of the canyon winds through sage and pine before reaching an aspen grove wrapped in red twig dogwood. By the time you've reached the aspens, the stunning detail on the north wall has come well into view. What's striking is the water sculpted relief in the basalt front just beneath the canyon's battered rim. It is a long line of gnome-shaped gnome slabs, some the size of six-story buildings, some leaning into each other, some standing alone, all together looking like a procession of gigantic hooded druids walking above a steep talus slope. The sheer power of the bedrock gouging floods that carved the rock into what Brett's termed an extinct Niagara also left a mark below. The floods tore so deeply through the basalt, they exposed a gleaming underlying formation of granitic rock, the bedrock beneath the bedrock, so to speak. Near the mouth of the canyon, a massive molar of granite, nicknamed Gibraltar Rock, towers above a picturesque equestrian area. Instead of a flat trough in the well of the canyon, what you find is a long ridge of granite in repose between the basalt walls on either side. Because Northrop Canyon has the shape of, a, of the bone and a T-bone stake, what you see when you look down the canyon toward the east is a west-facing wall. The sense, of, the sense of confinement gives an impression the canyon is a world unto itself, which at least in a poetic sense it is. More broadly, the canyon's creation, merely 15,000 years ago, is a spectacular sideshow to the operatic earthworks of Grand Coulee. It is a story that unfolded over thousands of years as the Okanagan lobe of the Cordillera Ice Sheet advanced and retreated across the Waterville Plateau on the Coulee's western flanks. The, mice, the massive ice lobe was like a rail yard switch, opening and closing pathways for the inland tsunamis of floodwaters arriving from the east. The crest of Steamboat Rock is nearly 800 feet above Banks Lake, which itself is 300 feet above today's Lake Roosevelt. What that means is that the floodwaters climbed out of one gorge to create another hanging above it. At their height, the glacial floodwaters overflowed Steamboat Rock by more than 100 feet. Just think of that. The Brett's floods not only excavated both Grand Coulee and Northrop Canyon, but the largest pulses so inundated the Columbia River Valley that they overwhelmed and reversed the flow of a major tributary, the Wenatchee River. 
pushing water, upgrading and dropping ice rafted boulders from Idaho as far west as Leavenworth in the Cascade Mountains, nearly 20 miles upstream. What remains in today's landscape is a web of life-giving wetlands and dry pathways connecting natural monuments, such as Steamboat and Gibraltar. In Earth time, 15,000 years is, is barely any time at all, less than one three thousandth of 1% of the age of the planet. You can still cut yourself on the sharpness of the talus from the basalt facies scoured by the bread floods. And that's how it looks too, like a fresh calamity here to remind us about the power of nature and how transient and fragile we are by comparison. Deep in these canyons, we, invite, we are invited to consider how precious it is, it is to walk into the world beyond the reach of our schedules, invoices, and smartphones, to possess our fleeting senses and the consciousness to making meaning of it all, or at least to try. Thank you. So we, we've got a few hookups to do and I'll, I'll get started on the slideshow. Thanks for bearing with that. <laughs> Appreciate it. <laughs> you absolutely do. It's back by um, that, that wall and then you, you can hike northward up to Northrop Lake. Yeah, it's a beautiful spot, especially in the fall. The fall color there is, is remarkable. By the way, Northrop Canyon, this is not in the book, is the, uh, the only place in Grand Canyon where you'll find trees. <laughs> I mean, the rest of the county is treeless, but you'll find uh, majestic pines and, and eagles in uh, Northrop Canyon. Okay, I should start the slideshow. <laughs> We've got to get on with it. Um, Here we go. Well, this didn't come up in full screen, so give me a minute to solve that puzzle. Got any ideas here? I'm sorry. No, it's been a long day. <laughs> there we go. That should do it. Very good. Okay. So I need to back up to the top. That's the one. So uh, I know um, in a book full of geologists and rocks, I'm starting with a fish and you're wondering what the heck's going on. So this is my friend, Oscar. Um, I swim with him almost every day this summer in the Spokane River. Um, and there's one of his friends behind him. So Oscar is a native red band trout, which has become sort of the... Uh, the mascot of the Spokane River and also the Spokane baseball team now. Uh, if you go to the baseball park, you'll see the mascot dressed up like a red band trout. Um, it is a, um, it's a fish that, to me, um, as someone who swims in the river almost daily, um, helps celebrate the recovery of the Spokane River from being one of the most polluted rivers in America. And part of what makes it possible is what he's swimming over there. Those are actually Missoula flood cobbles in the Spokane River. Um, the, the branch of the Spokane River, the main branch as we know it today, was not there before the Missoula floods. It was the, the river used to run considerably north of where it runs now by the, through the Bowen Pitcher. And um, these cobbles are all the way back to Lake Pond Array, and they bring Spokane its drinking water and they bring Spokane for our river. So if you want a connection between the great floods and life as we know it today, Oscar's enjoying it. Here's, um, this is one of my water photos called the Cosmos. By the way, uh, all the photos you see um, behind you there are from my cameras and they're for sale tonight if you want to stick around and examine them. Um, so this is what they look like. This, these are, um, 
you know, there's a, there's a lot of granite in there because, because that's those that's in the mountains too. But, but a lot of what you're seeing here in the color is is the solidified mudstone from the uh, called argillite uh, and some quartzite as well from what is called the belt basin, um, which uh, is an ancient basin that formed a billion and a half years ago. I'm going to talk about it a bit because I just want to explain the deep story before the great floods. Um, so what basically what happened is when the um, Lake Missoula ice dam by Clark Fork failed, it would just throw all this ice and water and rocks and, this, it, and it was headed towards Spokane. Spokane basically became the, the nozzle for the great floods headed further west. This is another view from my swimming hole. This is one of the massive boulders that the, the great floods dropped there. I'm also showing you this because that hill behind there is entirely flood cobbles. I mean, it looks like a, a palouse hill, but it is, it is just full of, if you go to the top there and I've done this, what you'll get is pieces like this. This is an ancient uh, cobble from the Belt Basin. It's a million and a half years old, this cobble, argillite. Now this is a, a bit of a departure of, I mean, what is this? Well, this is what, um, this is the ancient continent um, Columbia looked like a, a billion and a half years ago. And Laurentia is ancient North America. You'll see the belt basin right in the middle where the arrows are pointing. The Mawson continent is half Australia and half Antarctica. And then there's Northern Australia and up in the darker green. Those red areas are granitic and other felsic rock that are releasing sediments that were, believe it or not, coming into our country <laughs> a billion and a half years ago. They came into the belt basins. So these cobbles don't just have sediments from North America. They've got sediments in them from um, Australia and Antarctica. And the reason we know this is my, <laughs> I mean, Steve Box is one of my, Steve is the lead author on this paper from 2020, but he was part of a team of geologists who used what we call zircon analysis to find the, zircons are small crystals. You can find them in jewelry stores even. And what they hold are just key information. I mean, I'm, I'm a generalist and I'm, I'm not a geologist, but I kind of think of them as the DNA inside these rocks. And they're remarkably long lived. And we can see by looking in the zircons, the decay chains of radioisotopes. When zircons form, they, they soak up uranium and expel lead, which I know it's, it's technical, but it allows scientists to actually look at the decay chains and gather precise information on when these rocks form and the conditions under which they form. And that's why uh, Steve and his team, and plus a, a team from Australia, have been able to stitch together what ancient com uh, Con and Columbia looked like a billion and a half years ago. Um, and this is Rodinia. This is um, 750 to 700 uh, million years ago uh, when Rodinia um, rifted half the uh, belt basin, apparently wound up. This is from Marley Miller's uh, Roadside Geology of Washington, wound up in Australia. Uh, at that time, Spokane was a seacoast city, and pretty much everything to the left of Spokane, to the west of Spokane, got added to Washington State in the last 200 million years, coming in off uh, plates from the Pacific, basically. Um, moving back to uh, closer to the Holocene, which is where we are now, this is uh, the Pleistocene. This is what the, the ice sheets look like at the height of the last ice age. And we're looking, uh, I put on the map here um, where Grand Coulee is, uh, Glacial Lake Missoula over to um, be your right. And then also uh, Wallula Gap, which is uh, the place where the, the flood waters broke through the um, North, one of North America's most elegant water gaps on their way to the, uh, the Pacific Ocean. This is a cross section uh, that part of, uh, what I was saying about what was, what's been added to um, our state, Washington state in the last 200 million years is basically everything to the left of 
the NA. NA stands for North America. The PC belt, green stripe there is the belt basin. Um, the CRBG is those, the Columbia River basalts that you'll see forever once you get, uh, I shouldn't say forever, but for <laughs> miles in all direction once you cross the Columbia River. And these going to uh, the subdu subduction zone, what you're looking at are terrains that got added to um, North America, ancient Laurentia in the last 200 million years. This is um, a very serene winter photo of the upper of an upper part of Lake Ponderé. And the region that's in the book and in the slideshow is that mountainside in the middle where you see that snow. Um, it looks as though someone has taken a trowel and flattened that mountain. That's Green Monarch Ridge. That is where the ice sheet dock that dammed the Clark Fork River, creating ancient Lake Missoula. The ice eventually filled all of what you would know now as like Pond Array, but that's where it docked. Oh, my mother and her dad, how did they wind up? Well, they wound up in the book because in many ways, um, they're my inspiration. They were both beautiful people. Um, I grew up in a large uh, Catholic family and we would go to Pasco every couple of years in a station wagon. I had four sisters. Yes, I survived that. Um, and a brother. And my mom, we would get, we would arrive in Pasco um, late June usually, and she would say, God's country. And, you know, we were growing up in the tropics. I was, we were growing up in Panama at the time. My dad worked for the canal company where we're living in this rainforest, you know, and she, we're looking out at this barren landscape and having our laughs. But she's, she was right. I mean, if you're just visiting uh, the scab lands in the height of summer, it's pretty bleak. If you visit in the spring, it's, it's a different story. Um, and this is Willow the Gap. This is a picture taken in late spring. Um, this, is, um, this is sacred ground to me. Uh, Gil uh, exposed me to Willow the Gap when I was a young lad. He was taking me fishing up in the Blue Mountains and we went through Willow the Gap. Uh, it really is one of North America's great water gaps. And of course, uh, when the floodwaters came, they overflowed everything here. There, those cliffs to the right are dramatically high, but if you get to the top, you'll see Scablon on top. There was enough water left over from overflowing the gorge that they actually created Scablon on the other, other side as well. And of course, uh, the point of this picture on the rocky ground is to show that this is Scablon terrain. Um, this is an interesting story. <laughs> Um, I'm, what I'm showing you on this slide is just, um, the, this is the general footprint, all of the colored areas, the, the general footprint of the Columbia River basalts. The mustard brownish one in the middle with where it has Ritzville and Pasco, that's a, that's a Wanapum member of, of the, or the Rosa member of the Wanapum basalt, a 15 million year old basalt flow. That purple line is actually the vent line this is where the, 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 the magma actually burst out in these. If you remember a few years ago, the, the scenes from the Big Island in Hawaii with the, the fountains of lava, not coming from a volcano, but coming from fissures. Well, that was happening all along that purple line there. In fact, if you're, if you're headed from Ritzville to Spokane, you'll, you'll drive by the Tokyo rest stop, which used to be a Stuckey's, but now I think sells quite a bit of marijuana. But in any event, um, that's pretty much where the, the vent passed what is now I-90 today. Uh, this is one of my favorite photos from the Spokane River. Uh, that's actually Grand Ronde Basalt uh, beneath uh, this beautiful football-sized piece of argillite uh, from the Belt Basin, again, illustrating just the, uh, the, the, the nature of the deposit that the, um, the Lake Missoula floods brought into the Spokane area. This is, um, this is actually the spatter from that vent I was showing you earlier that ran, that ran, ran up um, um, the spine there toward Ritzville. So this is where, this is actually the 15 million year old um, basalt, as it got ejected in the air, it got aerated and it's still sitting there on the hillside in colors of, of uh, red and blue and gray. Um, so 
this you have to imagine from the the map we we saw earlier this this sheet of lava moving to the west and this is where some of it settled this is the feathers formation in frenchman springs coulee this is not i mean i tease people that are in too big a hurry to get to seattle if you just take 10 minutes and pull off the road as you get to the silica exit uh, headed down towards vantage and just follow the old Vantage Highway, you'll come to this formation. It's like Stonehenge on steroids, only it's not human made. Nature made this. Uh, miraculously, after the, the, the floods created Frenchman Cooley, they left this stand of earthen timber. These are massive basalt pillars that just happened to survive the floods. Incredibly popular um, climbing spot, which was one reason I photographed it in winter, <laughs> so we could get <laughs> just the rocks and not humans. I had the honor recently of, uh, of having dinner with Randy Lewis, uh, the great Wenatchee storyteller and elder. And uh, I didn't know that it, Randy was going through my book. He knew just about where every place was in the book. What's well, special about his family used to live in this bowl three or four generations back. They lived here, which I had no, I didn't know that when I wrote the book. But what a remarkable story. Great guy, too. It was wonderful to, to share a meal with him. Uh, Jay Harlan Bretz, um, posing in hard hat next to Route Mush Rushmore. I think he was being tongue in cheek, but it's still a great picture of him. Um, so the Brett story is um, he was a high school teacher in Seattle, uh, and he became hooked on geology. He actually is, even before he became a geologist, he was actually doing a lot of the work that described the glacial, um, the Puget Lobe and its effect on the Puget Sound. But he was, he, he heard that there was a new USGS map coming out on uh, Frenchman Cooley. I'm sorry, Puddles Cooley, which is south, um, it's actually north of Frenchman Cooley on, on your way to Quincy. Uh, and so this is the map that came out in 1910 and he was one of the first in line to look at it. What, what surprised Brett's is that this was an incredible feature. I mean, this is what it looks like in real life. Uh, this is, I know this looks like it's taken from an aircraft or drone, but I'm actually standing on the back rim of the, of the coolie taking this. This is just the north ventricle. There are two ventricles to pot, potholes and I could only fit one in the, in the camera I was using. Uh, but this will give you, so in Brett's mind, he's going like, what is this? I mean, because the, the land around that is just perfectly flat, it seems, you know, like a, just a, a grid um, in terms of its flatness. He wanted an explanation. Of course, his explanation would turn out to be that it was caused by the Great Flood. He called it the Spokane Flood, and he referred to it singularly, but we now know, um, Brett did not know at the time that the source of the floodwaters was Lake Missoula. What he could see um, when he studied, when he, he arrived in Spokane a century ago this summer with his, hi, Laura, my, my, cousin, my cousin made it. <laughs> Folks at home, my cousin Laura is here tonight. We're good. <laughs> okay, now I can finish. <laughs> Thank you for coming. Um, so this is the, the, the map that Brett's and his students took two years to put together. 1922 and 1923, it came out in late 1923 with his paper, The Channel Scavalance of the Columbia Plateau, which was heresy to the geologic establishment. They just couldn't believe that at one flood or, or even um, a series of floods had caused um, these features on the landscape. So, yeah, this isn't Scabland, this is Palouse, but it's Palouse really close to the Scablands. This is pretty close to to Rock Lake. Uh, my point about showing you the Palouse, which I, I, I love, I mean, it's obviously a beautiful, beautiful landscape, is that's pretty much all we would have if it weren't for the floods. We would have a landscape like this. We wouldn't have uh, as beautiful as the Palouse Hills are, as abundant they are as in producing lentils and wheat. We just wouldn't have the wetlands and the diversity of wildlife that we have in Eastern Washington were it not for the great floods that open it up. And the reason is simply that the, the Palouse soil as Nick Zentner, uh, the fabulous uh, geology professor at Central has explained is like, oh, um, Goldilocks soil. 
it's just perfect, almost perfectly designed to hold water and soak it up, which makes it a you know, prolific soil for grain, but not so much for flowing water and wetlands. This is from um, 1980, 1988 USGS paper on the Spokane Aquifer that just makes the point in one picture. It's an illustration of how Spokane, uh, my hometown was just, my adopted hometown now was just the nozzle for the great floods. And so I hope, I hope I've captured that in some of my photography in the river and in the Spokane area. But that's people, if there are people that have lived in Spokane all their lives. So they went, here I am a scabline photographer. They asked me, how long does it take to get there? And I said, well, just step out your front door, you're in it. It's hard to recognize because of course, Spokane is covered with these beautiful um, ponderosa pine trees. Um, this is headed, this is the floodwaters headed out south and east of Spokane. This is a Camas bog um, on the way to Sprague Lake. Now this is, <laughs> yeah, I know what the heck is this doing in my slideshow. This is the Willamette meteorite. This is the, the largest meteorite to land in North America. Um, and it was found in the, well, the Native Americans knew about it. I think they called it Tomanoas uh, before white settlers found it and realized that they were onto something because they hit it with a hammer and it rang. And there's a long story about how they tried to pilfer it off property so they could sell it. It was, it was ultimately sold to the, um, I think it's the American His uh, Natural History Museum in New York that purchased it. But this is virtually all um, um, iron, like 95% iron and other metals. Um, the thing about where it was found in the Willamette Valley is that there's no meteor crater, <laughs> okay? You find the meteor, there's no meteor crater, what's going on? Well, this is the most exotic glacial erratic. This meteorite didn't land in the Willamette Valley, it came down somewhere in Canada and got picked up by the Purcell Trench Glacier. The glacier comes down, blocks Lake Missoula, the dam breaks and off goes not just water and mud, but big icebergs carrying rocks. And my God, th this huge meteorite. I'm, I mean, I've gotten the book how much it weighs, but it, it was tons. So you have to imagine this meteor coming down, uh, you know, basically from where Sandpoint is now, taking a right turn, going through Spokane, up over the Rim Rock, uh, out over um, the West Plains, down through a little gap, making the turn, heading down all the way to Columbia, and then taking a left turn into the Willamette Valley. Yes, ma'am. I was just in New York. Yeah. Museum, uh, museum, 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 museum. There you go. Thank you. I did not set this up, but that's yeah. just, you know, you. There's a my my friend Jack Nisbet who um, wrote a nice blurb for my book actually has a a story in his book uh, Ancient Places that tells the story of the Willamette meteor and I could I mean he he would tell the story much better than I would it's a great story there's all the ins and outs of how they tried to sneak it off the property but uh, give credit there was a high school teacher not that long ago in Oregon who actually cemented the puzzle by going back to where this was found and actually locating granitic erratics that had come in on the same iceberg. So when this iceberg melted, it didn't just drop um, Tomano Oros, the Willamette meteorite, it dropped these big chunks of granite that it also picked up along the way. I think it's a heck of a story. And it just, uh, you know, I'm always, as a writer, always looking for simple illustrations of the power of the floods, but just imagine that, just imagine that journey that this meteorite was on, uh, on in an iceberg in the, in the Brett's floods. This is, uh, again, some of the wonderful spring landscape. One of the reasons I've chosen this picture to share with you is this hill back there is a surviving Palouse Hill that was profoundly reshaped by the floodwaters. I refer to them as Brett's Hills because they're very elegantly described in his early papers. And what he noticed about them is that they were, they had st uh, steep slopes pointed towards Spokane and tailed slopes pointing toward Pasco. And basically that's because of the floodwaters, like you would see in a, even in a small stream with the current 
uh, was leaving its mark on the landscape in that direction. Uh, I, this one's in there just because I like the scab land, even when it has pines and frost on it. This is the scab land south of uh, Turnbull National Wildlife Refuge. Um, of course, arrowleaf balsam root. This is in a remote section of Whitman County, not far from uh, the, the um, Rose event that uh, I visited earlier with the red spatter. Of course, this is Palouse Falls. Uh, this is the Drumheller Channels, um, known to some as where Nick Zentner lost his hammer. Um, Nick was up here making a video one day with his rock hammer and it fell down between the, the cracks. This is uh, one of the rare uh, or the smaller and newer basalt flows called the Elephant Mountain basalts that made these beautiful palisades. If you've never been to the Drumheller Channels, um, they're between Moses Lake and Othello. And our, most of it is encompassed in the Columbia National Wildlife Refuge now, including this. Uh, this is back at uh, Potholes Cooley. Uh, this is the falls below Judith Pool, one of my favorite photographs from Potholes Cooley. And this is the, uh, the Grand U pipe of uh, Upper Grand Cooley that, in the, if you follow the road on the right side of the photo, it takes you basically towards um, that steamboat rock way the heck off in the distance there. Just the scale of this is just immense. Uh, this is uh, a little bit closer to home. This is um, the ramparts above uh, Moses Cooley where Douglas Creek comes in to Moses Cooley near the town of Palisade. It's just a beautiful uh, front of um, eroded basalt. These are some of my favorite flowers. Um, you know, um, you, my, my friend Charlie Gurchy is also a, a landscape photographer and you spend a lot of time waiting for the light. Um, Charlie brings his banjo and practices his music. He's also a semi-professional musician. I like to photograph flowers and deer. So that's what I do in my spare time. On the left, that's a Rocky Mountain, Mountain Iris. Uh, my favorite, they're all my favorites, but. My most favorite favorite is a green banded mariposa lily in the middle there that usually blooms late when everything else is dry. And it's, it reminds me of the orchids that I grew up with in Panama, it's just that beautiful. And that's a wild geranium there on the right. This is just a bouquet. This is blanket flower, yarrow and wild geranium among other things, growing lushly near Sprague Lake. Um, when you drive by, Sprague Lake, most of the time, you'd have a hard time believing that it could produce bouquets like this, but it does in the spring. R really beautiful. Um, this is another kind of balsam root called Carey's balsam root that grows, uh, that comes out later than the arrow leaf, has an oilier leaf. It, and as you can see, it's coming up with Douglas's onion, the wild onion of the scab lands. This is taken in the, um, the sort of the Pine Barrens uh, near Fish Trap Lake. Of course, this is Camas. I like this photo because it's got a Brett's Hill there in the background. This is a Camas bog out in, um, oh, I'd say it's uh, east of Sprague Ways. Um, <laughs> and this is Bitterroot, um, which is just a favorite of mine in terms of the improbability of it. I mean, when I find Bitterroot, it's, it seems to be growing right out of rock. You know, right out, not just a rock, but a, but a mound of rock. It's hard to, to believe that it's found soil there. But this is, um, so this was taken up in the, in the Spokane Rim Rock. This is as close to Spokane as I've seen, seen bitter root. And this was taken this spring. Just love the colors of it. Okay, um, so what we have here is an interesting um, critter story. This is uh, North America's smallest songbird, or smallest bird, actually. It does make a sound. It's called the Calliope hummingbird. It's basically the size of an insect. So we go from <laughs> North America and, and a denizen of the Scamblad. So this is um, North America's smallest bird onto one of North America's uh, largest animals. So this is, um, this is a moose I met this year. This is about oh, a minute or two after I almost hit him on my bike as I was coming down a hill. <laughs> Anyway, he, uh, I made sure that he um, wasn't in a foul mood before I got closer, but being careful to, I want to get close to get this picture, but I'm also, just so you know, 
don't mess with moose. <laughs> what I was trying to be careful to at least keep um, a healthy area of um, debris or shrubs between me and him if he changed his mind about me being there. But there you go, from the, the smallest to, the, to one of the largest. Um, this is um, a female moose uh, eating, uh, this is a winter shot where she's eating a red twig dogwood. This is out at the, uh, uh, this is out at the Turnbull National Wildlife Refuge. It was funny because um, Devin and I were sitting around, it was like Christmas time, you know, when you have family time, there's some days where nothing's planned. He says, what are we doing today, Dad? And I said, you know, I wanna go look for a moose. And he goes, yeah, let's go to Turnbull. And we, you know, what are the odds? And we, you know, we were there five minutes and there's the moose. I asked him to stay in the car while I <laughs> got this photo. Uh, hey, there's the mascot of the Wenatchee River Institute. It's the river otter. Um, this is in Laytaw Creek, which is not, which is a scabland stream, obviously not far, um, comes into the Spokane River. I, I met this guy, um, not one, this past river, but winter, but a uh, winter ago. He, he wasn't very happy to see me. And he actually barked at me. Um, which was kind of funny. And then, you know, got up and just kind of studied me. So he was not, uh, I, he was, I don't think he was inviting me to swim and I probably wouldn't have because there's ice on the water, but it was a different, I had a different experience when Devin was young because he and I actually got to swim with a very happy young river otter in, in Lake Talk Creek back when I was teaching Devin to swim. <laughs> Mule deer. So I'm out uh, early in the morning setting up for a sunrise shot in the drum heller. And I just get the sense that somebody's watching me and I turn around and, and there they are just peering. This is a mule deer, our, our matriarchal society. So you can see that the, <laughs> these are all, there's one uh, male back there, but you can see all the, all the girls are just like, hey, what's going on? <laughs> what are you doing here? Um, so in the secret of photographing mule deer for all it's worth is uh, if you come across a pack um, make sure you can, you can find the mom, find the, find the lead doe. And that's what happened with this shot. This was taken the, this spring. I, I was again coming down a hill on my bicycle. I noticed the, the two of them, the, the young buck and the mom at the same time. She's dining to my left. I put my bike down and I go and greet her and do my best to you know, just get her to relax. And she does, she goes on eating. And then this guy feels safe enough. He's actually approaching me. Uh, you can tell this is early in the day because the morning sun is coming through his left ear. But that's their curiosity. Once he felt safe because his mother had essentially given him permission to not be afraid with me in the environment. So those, these are just some of the delightful um, experiences I've had. Uh, out in nature with these, in this fabulous um, landscape with these amazing animals. <laughs> this one was more, this is an American badger. I recommend a more ginger approach. And uh, th this, this guy was kind enough to uh, let me get quite close and get his photo. This is out near uh, the town of Lamont. Uh, coyote, um, beautiful coyote. Um, one of the animals that are especially wary. Um, I mean, yeah, I mean, it, it's disheartening to see. Sometimes you'll see piles of, of dead coyotes out there from, from um, gunshots. Um, so I was telling Audrey earlier tonight, I have kestrel envy. That, kestrels uh, like the one on the wall there are incredibly hard to, to photograph because they are so wary of people. They will take flight um, usually before you even see them. And this one was just, um, gosh, this is so far out in the Scablands. Oh gosh, I'm gonna say this is south of Rock Lake on a ranch and he, um, he was just um, distracted enough by his, wanting to have lunch that he didn't mind me taking his picture. He wasn't there for very long, but a beautiful bird, just um, gorgeous. This is the red-tailed hawk, obviously, the, the signature of the Scablands, for sure. Cooper's hawk in the winter, um, hunting. Uh, he was after, um, he was really s scaring the heck out of morning doves that day. These are some of my favorites. These are, um, 
I mean, I grew up with pelicans in Panama, but there were the smaller brown pelicans. The, uh, the North American white pelican has a wingspan of nine feet. They're almost like small aircraft. And I have actually mistaken them at times for hang gliders because they're just so huge. And uh, they'll, they don't often come as far north as Spokane, but this is pretty close. This was on, a, on Clear Lake, which is in the Four Lakes area near Spokane. Of course, you'll see them lower in the basin uh, down near Pasco on the Columbia quite a bit. These are two of my favorite marsh birds. We're gonna actually, in the video that I'm gonna show you lately, we're actually gonna hear, a, if you have not heard um, a yellow-headed blackbird, uh, it's called, you're, you'll hear one tonight. It's, it's um, pretty alarming. <laughs> So uh, Western Bluebird uh, um, speaks for himself, that's a male. Rufus sighted Toey or uh, uh, Spotted Toey, as others call him. I, I love the red eye in this photo, another uh, staple of the scabland aviary. Uh, this is a black-headed grosbeak, another one of my favorite birds. Um, Western Kingbird flexing on a wire. Uh, again, I just can't get enough of calliope hummingbirds. This is another calliope that I photographed earlier this year. And this is the, um, the sacred bird of the Wanabum tribe. This is a Bullock's Oriole, um, which um, I lived in Spokane quite a while before I saw my first Oriole. And uh, it, it just stunned me. It's just, a, especially the males, they're, uh, well, they're not, I mean, color-wise, they're not that different from Baltimore Orioles, but uh, a beautiful bird. Uh, and actually, this, uh, this is a heron I befriended last winter. This photo is actually one of the, the aluminum-mounted photos in the back of the room. This is called Showtime. And, uh, you know, I really, uh, um, there are some herons that live on golf courses that are really used to people, but for the most part, they're not. And they, they really like to keep their distance. So this was not an easy photograph to get. I worked for this uh, over a period of really weeks to uh, find this heron and be present um, with her to just make sure that she was at ease with being photographed. And the, and the payoff was uh, you know, a dramatic shot like this. Hooded for cancer. I mean, say no more. So I noticed that the diving ducks really sparkle in winter, and you can see on the, you know, how beautiful these are on a snowy, on a snowy creek on a winter day. It's a male hooded for cancer. Um, these are male um, golden eyes, and these are their girlfriends. These are uh, <laughs> two female uh, golden eyes on a different part of the same creek. The gray catbird, which is the, one of the superb vocalists that I run into. Um, they're, and they're funny in the way they just have this incredible vocal range. Uh, and this is, this, is my, this is the bird that when I hear in the spring, I almost tear up. Well, I do tear up, I'm not sentimental. They just have such an ebullient. This is the Western metal art. Just a garrulous, I'm here at spring. Let's let's talk life, you know. It's just, uh, and sometimes I hear them, and it sounds like an explosive song, like it's right next to me, and it'll be uh, sometimes thirty yards away. It just has a tremendous reach. This call, yeah. Northern flicker, um, beautiful bird that sometimes drives people nuts by banging on their chimneys. What a great bird to see in the wild and uh, be present to their behavior. There's uh, one in the video that I'll show here shortly. Trumpeter swans uh, visit, we get two cracks at them during, during uh, spring and fall migrations. This is on a frozen lake um, on the way to Lamont a couple winters ago. This is one of my favorites. This is, uh, you know, the, the interesting thing about lower Grand Coulee, uh, as opposed to upper Grand Coulee, which is just this big half, U-shaped half pipe, is Below uh, Dry Falls, you get this enormous spread of uh, canyons and, and coolies that are seldom visited. One of them is, is Dry Coulee, which um, is one of my favorites and where I got this, this shot. 
And these are um, black locust trees. I just love this photo for the spiritual essence of the landscape. Um, it, there's, a, I guess, a tinge of sadness in this. This is an abandoned farmstead, you know, which planted uh, the, the locusts live about 100 years or so. Um, these seem to be at the end of their time. But um, very poignant. I mean, I. Um, I wanted to be um, in a lighthearted mood tonight because that's, I think, my, the better part of my nature. But, you know, th this book was really a, a process of lifting myself off, a, um, off the ground. And, um, and I had to, um, I had to take in not just the, the beauty of this landscape, but the, the lines on its face too. And, and be present to what I imagine to be the stories of um, people who tried to live here and didn't succeed. Um, so maybe the best thing for me to do with a photo like this is not talk about it so much and just let it, let it speak for itself. Um, God, I've got great kids. Um, Audrey's just been the best daughter I could hope for. Um, she's really good with words. Um, my, my son, Devin, not so much. Um, but man, he, he can play a saxophone like nobody's business. And um, he's been through a lot too. And he's able to channel his emotions through his music. And so this is a tribute to them. They've really kept me company. Uh, not just in the desert, but in their hearts. And I just want to acknowledge that. So before I break into tears and flood the room, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to shut up and we're going to show uh, an eight minute video um, if we have time. <laughs> okay. Thank you for bearing with that. <laughs> okay. I'm going to sit down and watch this. <laughs> As you made it. You know, it's barely bigger than my thumb. Without so, if you imagine my thumb with that ring of tail feathers, it's it's just like seeing an insect in some ways. It's, but they're you know they're they stick up for themselves. You know they if they get messed with with the other hummingbirds, they they won't give ground. I, 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 just, I think I'll let this speak for itself. It, 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 if we back it up far enough, it'll have a title. You, you can just hit play.
Thank you. <laughs> Thank the animals. <laughs> um, so I'll take a couple questions if, um, <laughs> if we Okay. Okay, I'll ask one. <laughs> the geographical area is ecological. Um, you know, and so Brett's as, used that term in his paper, but he 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 referenced it as what the the uh, the, the the European pioneers called the scablands. I mean, that was their term for it because it. That's what it looked like to them. Obviously, there wasn't a lot of soil there to grow crops in. So it's, um, it, I don't think it has a technical geologic definition. It's kind of like you know it when you see it, but it, it does generally stand for that area where the, the, the glacial flood waters tumultuously scoured the landscape, creating, you know, down to the rock, but also creating these braided channels that Brett's uh, sure. wrote about quite a bit. And then I was also hoping to get like a definition of a coolie, what a coolie is. Yeah, so that's, um, I'm glad you brought that up because what, um, and Brett's had made this point too, you know, your, tip, your typical valley that's, that's going to exist from a long, long scale river erosion is gonna be V-shaped. The coolies were U-shaped. And to him, that was a, um, the descriptive giveaway of what had happened there in terms of the massive flooding that it just carved up these U-shaped channels suddenly, you know, the, from catastrophic flooding rather than the, the V-shapes that you would expect. The other thing that, uh, that people aren't aware of generally is that the waterfalls in the Columbia River Gorge are all created by the great floods. This is a, where the flood waters came in and took out the legs of what would have been a gentle slope that would have brought those streams down to the Columbia. It just cut through and with that U-shaped, that's why you have these gorgeous waterfalls in the, in the Columbia River Gorge. Yeah. Is that Cooley, is, is it called that because of the U, Cooley, you know, or, I mean, is it, the origin I, of it is know, it I'm embarrassed, French? I don't know. I mean, it's just gonna, you, you bring it up, <laughs> it makes you wonder where did that word come but, from? But I don't, I haven't, you know, I've been around the country. I don't know of any region that calls its canyons Cooleys. I mean, the way we do. I mean, it's a Northwest descriptor of our landscape. Yeah. Sure. What is it that draws you there? You know, um, gosh, I, I tried to describe that in the setup of the book. It just, uh, it connected me with some really good people. Um, I like the fact that it's um, underestimated that uh, and for me as an aesthetic, as a, both a writer and a photographer, it was uh, um, just a, I won't sound too grandiose about it, but it was kind of a spiritual mission to get this right. I was, you know, when we did the, uh, the first Beautiful Wounds photography exhibit, the, probably the best moment I've had in years was I was, I'd been introduced to a woman on the way in and I didn't realize that she was part of the museum staff. And I, circle back and um, my host introduced me to her again and she just started crying. And I was like, and I, as I looked at her, oh, what's wrong? And she pointed to one of my photographs. She said, that's my home. It doesn't get any better than that because that's what I was trying to accomplish. You know, I'm, it, there's, there really is great affection. There are people all over the world that have scabbling experiences and often they're their sense of home and their sense that um, um, they almost have more pride in it that has been you know, cast off as a, a no man's land or a, a land unfit for people. So I was really hoping to capture that. I was heartbroken at the time and I didn't want to answer my phone. I didn't want my friends to throw their arm around my shoulder. I just wanted to be alone and face it head on. I had to rebuild myself and this seemed like as good a place as any to try to do that. Oh, I just wanted to ask, where actually was the, the glacier that dammed up and created Lake Missoula that 
broken. It's called the it's called the Purcell Trench Glacier. Where is it? It it's uh, well the Purcell Trench is a you can visit it today. It's if you go um, to Sandpoint mm -hmm. and just take the road along the top of the lake towards Clark Fork, you'll be going basically through the Purcell Trench. But it also extends well down towards Spokane. The, the, the trench extends down towards Spokane. I want to make clear that the ice sheet did not reach Spokane, but the trench does go down. Uh, it comes in on the, in the Spokane Valley. There's even a sign out there that on, I think it's like Trent Avenue where you're, you're seeing the Purcell Trench. So. Yeah, it's there. I, um, I almost wish I could get everybody on the bus and we could go visit <laughs> that area. No, it's really beautiful. I've been up to, I showed you Green Monarch Ridge. I've actually been up on top where you can look back to the north where the ice sheet would have come from. And you can actually see the rocks where the ice sheet docked. That's pretty cool. Well, at least for a, a, a rock hound like me, it's pretty cool. <laughs> yeah, let's go get on the bus to go do that. So, yes, sir. And did they say that the flood happened many times? It wasn't yes. one cataclysmic event, it was multiple. Dozens, right? At least dozens of times, yes. And I think the most recent, um, gosh, I was just looking at my notes in my hotel room. I think the most recent Lake Missoula flood would have been 13,600 13, years ago, I think. Yeah, and the, yeah. I mean, there have been, there were other floods that were created when the, um, um, the other ice lobes, the Okanagan lobe, and, um, oh gosh, I'm spacing on the other one. But there are a couple other lobes that created, um, uh, glacial Lake Columbia and Glacial Lake Spokane that, that collapsed later in the cycle. <sighs> Young lady in the back. <laughs> I was wondering if you could talk about how Harlan Bretz made his map of the Scablands, you know, considering that it was the early 1900s. And then if you could also talk about um, his journey with the scientific community. His what in the scientific? His journey with the scientific well, community. Was, you know, it's, um, so the map is just, you know, a lot of this was done on foot. Uh, a lot of how he moved himself and his students around was actually hitching rides on trains. Um, the uh, science staff at Lewis and Clark High School finally got together and got him a car that he could go out there. But it was just grindingly hard work. Uh, I mean, what he put him and his students through, I mean, Brett's, um, um, before the trauma of being rejected by his peers, was a, he just, um, I don't want to say happy-go-lucky, but he was a very high-spirited individual. He, he loved organizing field trips. Uh, even when he was in Seattle, he was organizing field trips into the gorge. He was upset at the faculty at the University of Washington, where he was for a year, because they actually didn't believe in going on field trips. And going, what the heck is this? You, we're geologists, we don't go on field trips. So he had that spirit about him. What broke his spirit were the Eastern establishment, um, which was afraid of this theory sounding uh, a lot like Noah's flood or creationism, which they resisted as scientists. Um, and it just, it just didn't do Brett's. Brett's was not trying to, you know, advance the idea of biblical floods. He, he, you know, he was like an agnostic at best. He was just simply trying to tell the story that he was finding. And it was just um, heartbreaking. He, was, he wasn't just rejected. He was at the meeting in 27, he was invited to a prestigious gathering at the, I think it was the Cosmos Club in DC. And he thought they were gonna award him and yet they mocked him and it crushed him. And um, he lived long enough to be vindicated and one of, one of the best parts of my story was I was actually at Wazoo when it was learned that he was gonna uh, win the top um, geological award, um, the Penrose Medal, which he did two years. He died at like age 98 and he was given the Penrose Medal, I believe when he was 96. The glee in the, on the geology staff at Wazoo was just palpable. I mean, they were just, there, Brett's had a lot of friends in the geologic community in the Northwest and uh, you know, really felt that he had been robbed. And so it was just a great vindication for him to get the Penrose Medal before he died. So I'm gonna stop there. I'm sorry if I'm gone on too long. <laughs>
and, and thank you for your patience and thanks for your questions and thanks for coming out tonight to be with me. I really appreciate it. And thank you so much for being here this evening. Thank you all so much for being here this evening. Um, if you are interested in signing up for our WRI e-news mailing list and you didn't get a chance, there's a sign up sheet on the clipboard by the door. Um, and our one request, I mentioned that this was a fifth grade classroom this afternoon. We transformed it into our Red Barn event space and it is turning into a fourth grade chemistry lab for tomorrow. So if you are able to help stack chairs, I will wheel the chair cart out. And if you can stack your chair on your way out, that helps us transition the space once again.